All right. Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dome to Home. We are excited to have you with us this lovely Wednesday. Uh, my name is Tara. I'm a planetary scientist and a CU alum and a presenter here at the planetarium. And Miss Amanda is here with me again this week. Hi, Amanda. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, excited to talk about something, you know, a little bit different today. Um, and as you guys know, I'm a student at CU Boulder. I love navigating for FISC and I love doing these Dome to Home shows with you guys. It's always nice to know that we're sending out some cool information and feel free to let us know if you learned something at the end of the video, because that would make our hearts real happy. <laughs> yeah, we always like to know when you're having fun too. And speaking of, if you do have anything you want to tell us, or if you have any questions or anything during the show, you can always drop those in the chat here. Might be just your right, might be a little down just beneath the screen there, but we've got our question master, Ramey, here, and she's uh, keeping an eye on those, so she'll pass them along to us. I'll try to answer some as we go, but we have time dedicated at the end to, if, to get to those questions. We also wanted to say that if you're ever looking at the screen and it looks really small, you can't make out what some things are, try and maximize your screen. Go full screen with the YouTube and sometimes that helps because we are going to be looking at a couple of diagrams and stuff today. So I want you to be able to see those. So as you probably know, today we are talking about not just the Perseverance to Mars mission, but how it got there, aka rockets. So this is super exciting. Rockets are really cool. But before we can talk about rockets themselves, we have to talk a little bit about gravity. So first off, we got to think, what is gravity? Now, you probably have a lot of experience with gravity and you could say a lot about it. But in general, the way that we think about it on a kind of big picture level is that gravity is just an invisible, attractive force that kind of holds things together. But if you want to get a little more complex with it and think about it the way that Einstein thinks about it or thought about it, gravity is the bending of space-time. Sounds complex, right? But Amanda just put up this great diagram here that you can kind of use to visualize what that's like. We also sometimes say that it's kind of like space-time is a trampoline. And if you were to put something really heavy, like a bowling ball, on that trampoline, it's going to cause it to bend down a little bit. And that's what you see in the picture here. You see the Earth kind of bending that space time and making a little hole there. And bigger objects that are more massive, have a lot more stuff in them or heavier, they're going to bend space time a little bit more. They have more gravity. And so the bigger a thing is, or not necessarily bigger, but the more massive it is, the more stuff it has in it, the more it bends. And the more it's going to be difficult to get out of the gravity of that object, like a planet or a star or a black hole or something big like that. So the more it bends, the harder it is to get away. But this attraction works both ways too. So for instance, you and the Earth. The Earth is exerting gravity on you. That's what keeps you stuck to the ground. The Earth is really big. You're very small. But you also have your own gravity and you're pulling on the earth too. Now it's just a very, very tiny bit because your gravity is very small because you are also not so massive in the grand scheme of things. Now the other thing about gravity is that it gets stronger the closer you are to something or in the opposite way, it gets less the farther away you are from something, which is kind of what you see in this picture here. You can see how these little arrows are coming in and as they get closer to that thing called a singularity, they start falling faster. So if you're near a really big thing and you're really big too, it's going to be really hard for you to escape the gravity of this object, say a rocket leaving a planet, because rockets are very big. Now you can kind of think of it in this way. There's a thing called escape velocity, a certain speed that you have to be going to get away from an object and break free of its gravity. For instance, on the Earth, if you think of an average person, when you jump up in the air, or maybe you've seen somebody jumping up in the air like a basketball player, they're moving about one and a half meters every second, which is about like four feet or so every second. But to leave the Earth's gravity entirely, you have to be leaving 11,000 meters per second. That's almost 25,000 25, miles per hour. 
to get off of the earth. So this is a big deal and something that we have to contend with when we're thinking about our rockets. We need to make them really strong and really powerful so they can get away from the earth, but we also need to make them really lightweight or as lightweight as we can so that they're not, their mass isn't affecting it too. It's easier for them to get away that way. So speaking of rockets, especially today, we wanna to talk about the Atlas V rocket. Now, this is the rocket that launched Perseverance up into space. Obviously, it is not the only rocket that has ever existed. There are a ton of rockets you can see here on our picture. They come in all shapes and sizes. If you look in the very top left corner of this picture, that's a person, that tiny little dot right there. So you can see some of these rockets get really, really big. They're all a bit different. So we're talking specifically about the Atlas V rocket. So let's look at a picture of an Atlas V. Now this is not the newest rocket on the market either. Atlas V has been around since about 2002, but it's had 84 successful launches since then. So it's a good bet. We like it, it's reliable. And this is what it kind of looks like sitting there on the launch pad. You see that big ULA logo there on the tower. ULA is the United Launch Alliance, which is actually part of a, a group of launchers and they're based here in Centennial, Colorado. So some of you might be nearby or have seen or heard of ULA or maybe have parents or friends that work for ULA. It's a local company. So we're super excited to be involved in the rocket launching business. Now, overall, this rocket is it's hard to tell from here, but it's 191 feet long. That's like 18 stories high. So this thing is huge. It weighs over a million pounds. So again, we have to think about that when we're thinking about our rocket thrust and getting away from the earth. And they have to think about every little thing that they put on it from, you know, they even have to consider the weight of things like paint and stickers. I don't know if you are any race car fans out there. They do the same thing with race cars and NASCAR. They have to be concerned with the weight. So here's kind of a breakdown of what an Atlas V is like. It has these things called stages. Maybe you've heard of rocket stages, first stage, second stage, things like that. So the first stage is the one at the very bottom. That's the biggest and strongest and heaviest one. It burns a mixture of kerosene and oxygen to create all of that thrust that it needs to get away from the earth. That's what the first stage does. It's responsible for getting it off the launch pad and out of the earth's gravity. There's also some little things down on the side that you see often that are boosters. And those do exactly what they sound like. Those give it a little extra thrust to help get off that launch pad away from the earth in case that first stage doesn't have quite enough oomph. That's what we have those boosters for. Now, just above that, where you see it says Centaur, that is the second stage or the upper stage of the Atlas V rocket. Now, it also has some thrusters in it, but they're much smaller. They're not quite as powerful because those are the ones that kick on after we've left Earth's atmosphere. So once you're out into space, you're pretty far away from the Earth, far enough away that you don't need nearly as much thrust. So you can get a lot farther with a lot less work because there's a lot less gravity. You're farther from the earth. Now, this is the part that you may have heard burns oxygen and hydrogen, which is obviously the two components of water. So they can split up water to make this kind of rocket fuel. So we talked about there's also the boosters at the bottom and then up at the top, you see that payload fairing. And this is just like the little nose cone part, but that's where the spacecraft goes. All of that other stuff is just the rocket to get the spacecraft into space. So once it gets all the way out there, the spacecraft is right at the very top and it sort of pops off those little sides and then our spacecraft is out in space. And we can kind of show you the different stages of this rocket launching because not all of that stuff ends up going all the way to Mars. Bits and pieces of it fall off as you're moving through space, so as long as they're not needed anymore. So this is another picture. Sorry, this one's a little small and hard to read, but you can kind of see where this rocket leaves the earth. That first stage kicks on and gives it the thrust to get up high enough to where it's pretty much out of the atmosphere, getting far enough away from the earth. And then it jettisons that first stage. It kicks it out and it falls back to earth. 
So then it's just relying on the thrust from the second stage, the centaur stage. So it's got that smaller amount of thrust, but that gets it a little farther away. And once it gets all the way out to the point where that second stage isn't needed anymore, that drops off too. And so then you just have the payload fairing, the little nose cone with the spacecraft inside. And that's what ends up going all the way to Mars. So there's a lot going on there. Now, it, just a fun fact I like to throw in here too. In January of 2006, the Atlas V rocket set a new world record for being the fastest spacecraft leaving the Earth's atmosphere. It left at about 36,000 miles per hour which was way faster than that 25,000 that it needed just to leave. So it was really hauling. And for perspective, it's reaching a top speed of 47,000 miles per hour and a flight from Denver to New York at that speed would only take two minutes and 16 seconds. So that's way fast. You could get really, really far moving at that speed, which is pretty cool. Now we also want to talk a little bit about the launching itself. So we've talked about the rocket, how it's getting away from the gravity of the Earth. But let's talk a little bit about the exciting part of the rocket launch. Because rocket launches are super exciting. I don't know if any of you have been able to see them online or see videos or maybe even go to one. I haven't yet, but that would be super cool. So there's a lot that goes into just the launching part. They actually start about 10 days ahead of time where they put the rocket on what is called a mobile launch platform or an MLP. That's this thing right here. And I don't know if you can see it, but down near the tread right at the bottom, kind of towards the left, there's a little person there. So you can see how big this thing is. It is huge. The one for the Atlas V, the platform itself weighs one point three, four million pounds. It's huge. I don't know if there's any Star Wars fans in here, but it always reminds me of the big Jawa crawlers, the big things that move through the desert on those tracks that are massive. That's what it makes me think of. They put the rocket on top of that, and that's what carries it from the bay where they're keeping it all the way out to the actual launch pad. So they start that about 10 days before the, the nominal launch date. Now the actual countdown, what we think of as the countdown, starts about 12 hours ahead of time. So there's already people sitting at their desks 12 hours before launch, getting ready. That's when they do all of their systems checks and prepping and filling up the gas tank and all of that kind of stuff. This all happens in the 12 hours beforehand. Now, when most people think the really exciting stuff starts is about 90 seconds before launch, T minus 90, you may have heard. That's when they finally enable the launch control systems so they can test out to see if the space, the uh, rocket is actually going to launch the way that they think that they should. Everything looks okay, everything's set. Now, if you look at this picture in particular, we also wanna point out, you see that there's lots of towers around that rocket. See those down on the ground? That's because at a lot of places, especially at this uh, Cape Canaveral and NASA, they use different towers for different rockets. Because like we saw a minute ago, rockets come in all shapes and sizes and they couldn't all launch from the same tower. That's the tower that holds them up. That's how the astronauts get on board. So those are really important and we need different ones for different rockets. So you see uh, most of the time you'll see lots of different towers on the same launch pad. Now you probably also notice a ton of what looks like fire and clouds and steam coming out of it. That is actually steam, but it's not from necessarily the rocket itself. It's not all the stuff that's, you know, coming out of the bottom, the jets that are hitting the ground and blasting smoke up. This is steam because they need to use water to cool down the launch pad from all of that thrust that this rocket is generating. It is kind of fiery when it's coming out, it's super hot. So they put about 300,000 gallons of water that they have to spray onto the launch pad to keep it from overheating. There's also, you can't really see them too well in this picture. I think they have another one coming up that you can see a little better, but they have to build trenches around the launch pad too. 
so that all of that fire when it's coming out of the rocket doesn't just hit the ground and then kind of curl back up and hit the rocket again because we do not want our rocket to catch on fire. That would be very bad. So they build trenches around the launch pad so that all of that fire can sort of be redirected and it goes down instead of back up onto our rocket because that would be pretty terrible. Now, the last thing that we want to talk about too is that it's not just important how we leave the Earth and get our spacecraft out into space or to Mars, but we also have to really consider when. When is very important as well. Now, you may have heard of these things called launch windows. This is a very exciting thing. So these launch windows are basically the times where it's the most optimal for us to send a spacecraft to another planet. So to get a good look at this, we're actually gonna leave the Earth and look at our solar system from up top. So Amanda, can you blast us off? Yeah, absolutely. Make sure everybody, you put your helmets on, you make sure they're all sealed up with air. We're getting on our own rocket ship and blasting off the Earth. And we are gonna go ahead and count down. We'll do our own mini liftoff. So everybody go ahead, count with me if you're at home, get your mom, get your dad, make sure everybody's ready for launch. And we're going to go in five, four, four, three, three two, two, one, one, blast, blast off. off. All right, up through the clouds. Ooh. And now let's turn around and look back at our Earth. There it is, our big, beautiful Earth. We made it, guys. Good one. Hooray! So we survived the hardest part, just getting away from the Earth. So like I said, we need to think about these launch windows and when is a good time for us to send something to another planet. So with Perseverance, obviously it's going to Mars. So we need to think about when is the best time for us to send something from Earth to Mars. Now you might be thinking that the best time would be to do it when Earth and Mars are closest together. That way it's got the shortest distance to go. It won't take as long to get there. It doesn't need as much fuel. And that's a good thought. And that's what I thought at first too. But in fact, that's not the best time to do it. And we're gonna look at why. So you can see this is, this is now, Amanda? Yep, this is today. So today, this is what Earth and Mars look like from up above. You can see they're pretty close to, e pl okay, close to each other. We just passed the closest point just a few days ago. But we need to consider that the Earth and Mars are moving. We know that. But the Earth, because it's closer to the sun, it has a shorter orbital time. It moves faster than Mars does. So over the course of a few days, a week, a month, you can see here that the Earth is really outpacing Mars. It's getting farther and farther away. So if we were to launch our rocket when Earth and Mars were closest together, it would actually end up having to go farther because it's got to turn around and go back and catch up with Mars. I think this picture is a really great diagram to help explain this. It was really helpful for me when I first saw it. So what we need to do is launch our spacecraft or our rocket a little bit before they're at their closest point. So we want to go back a few weeks, maybe like two months or so. Because at that point, when we leave the Earth, you can see the rockets going around and Mars catches up with the rocket. And it still has a little ways to go, but it's not nearly as far as it would have to go otherwise. So really those launch windows are the optimal period for us to get our spacecraft to the other planet, which I think is pretty cool. But there's a lot of other stuff we have to think about too with getting to another planet, not just how long it's gonna take and where those two planets are, but we also have to think about other things like where our moon is at this time, or where the ISS is, or where Mars's moons are going to be. Because the last thing we want to do is spend all of this time and work and money only to shoot our rocket and have it hit the moon. 
that would be super disappointing. I mean, it might be kind of cool, but it's super disappointing for all those people who wanted that spacecraft to go to Mars. And think about it. You can maybe think of some other things that we would need to worry about too, things to look for, things that we don't want to run into. There's all of that stuff to think about. And that is our time. And that is just a quick introduction to rocket science in 20 minutes. That's the Cliff Notes version. Next week, we're going to talk a lot more about what's happening once Perseverance is in space. Now that we've left the Earth, we're traveling through space and all of the cool things that happen on our way to Mars. And like I said, we saved some time here at the end in case you guys had any questions, which I can hopefully answer about rockets or Perseverance or Atlas V or orbital dynamics, any kind of rocket science stuff. That's what we're here for. if anybody has anything coming through. And while we're waiting, uh, since we are talking about the Perseverance launch itself, here is an idea of what Perseverance looks like if you haven't seen any of our previous videos. Yeah. So that's what it'll look like sitting on the surface. That's what's up in that nose cone of our rocket. On its way. A lot of times they'll make the spacecrafts and the instruments foldable kind of like origami. A lot of our spacecraft have like really big solar panels and they have to shrink them all down so that they'll fit inside that little nose cone. Ooh, we have a question here from Jeremy. How does our rocket program compare to those of other space agencies? That is a great question. And one that I like because our rocket program and other space agencies actually work together a lot. We send a lot of stuff into space on Russian rockets. They build a bunch of cool stuff that we can use. There's also rockets that are built in China and Japan and India. Um, and everybody kind of works together on this. So maybe they have a rocket that's more suited to the instrument that we're sending or the location that we're going. And they'll let us use one of their rockets. It's especially cool now that rockets and rocket parts are being reusable. It used to be they would just go up into space and they would burn up and we'd never see them again. But now we're coming into an age where we can reuse some of these parts like these second stages and the first stages that fall back to Earth. And you've probably seen uh, videos or maybe pictures of SpaceX having entire rockets land back on the surface. So there's a lot of cooperation happening with stuff like that, which is really, really cool. See, are there other space programs that are currently working on missions to Mars and the moon? They absolutely are. In fact, this launch window for getting to Mars, there were three different space agencies that launched during that window. So there was us sending the per Perseverance rover um, over there. There was also uh, the United Arab Emirates is sending their first spacecraft to Mars. It's called HOPE, EMM HOPE. And so they launched just a little bit before us. And then the Chinese space program have a uh, Mars rover that's going called Tianwen-1. And so that launched in this window too. So everybody kind of tries to get in this same window if we're all going to the same place. So it works out pretty nice. And we actually get to leave at different times too. We don't have to fight over time because all of the spacecraft are a little different. And so all of the rockets are a little bit different. So. Some of them need to leave earlier, some of them need to leave later, but in general, we can kind of work it out. So everybody gets to leave on their own time, but we all end up getting there at about the same time. So I think that answered some of those questions. Do we have anybody else coming through? Yeah, and while we're waiting, I'll go ahead and show a video of those SpaceX um, little rockets they're testing to keep those stages. And Tara said that you might have seen some videos where they launched something and then they were able to bring it back. And we actually have a video of that. So let's go ahead and check it out. Is it that little dot there? It Which sure is. Yep, here it comes. How cool is that? <laughs> Super cool. Like, it looks like it just went, it's like they played it backwards. 
<laughs> but no, it actually came back and landed on a boat. That's super cool. That's a really exciting thing because rockets are super expensive too. We didn't talk about that, but rockets cost a lot of money. So the more of those parts that we can save and reuse, the more that we save it's just sending them up there. Let's see, would you say there has been a recent flux of space launches? And if so, could you imagine a time where launch pads will become too crowded? Will there need to be new launch pads built? Absolutely. So we'll take these one at a time. Has there been an increase in the amount of rockets being launched? Yes. And that's mostly because A, we have more space agencies that are coming online. It's not just the US and Russia like it was back in the 60s. We have Japan, uh, the United Arab Emirates, India, even uh, Israel has a space program now. There's all sorts of new countries that are getting on board. And so that's one uh, factor. There's also the private space industry now, companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin and places like that who are launching their own rockets. So yeah, there's a lot more rockets launching than there used to be. Now, on the thing of launch pads getting crowded, that's a possibility. Um, luckily, a lot of these private space industries are also building their own launch pads. So like SpaceX, when they're testing rockets, doesn't necessarily use the big center at Cape Canaveral down in Florida. They have their own testing sites where they can launch from and then land on. And so it's not necessarily uh, taking away from any of the other time that was needed. And you also have to consider that we're not really launching that many rockets, at least not of this caliber, not like an Atlas V. It may seem like we're sending a lot of stuff into space, a lot of spacecraft, but it's only happening, you know, once every couple of years, something big like this is happening. Smaller things happen more frequently, like little rockets that are just putting up satellites just outside the Earth's atmosphere or even inside the Earth's atmosphere. You have options for things like that. And so those are easier to build and maintain. And there's rocket launch facilities all over the world. So these other space stations are also using their own. So like Japan doesn't send their rockets here to the US to launch. The United Arab Emirates sent theirs to Japan to launch. I think there's one in Australia or somewhere down around there too. There's several sites all over the world. So I think as long as, you know, people keep adding to the space, to the number of rockets that are being launched, there will have to build more launch sites eventually. But I don't think it's ever going to become an issue. I think we've got it pretty well sorted out. Great yeah, questions. And, uh, one cool thing that I didn't know was there are actually some launch pads in the ocean. So not all of our launch pads here on the ground, on the land, some of them are actually floating in the ocean. And as we know, uh, a lot of our earth is taken up by these oceans. So there's, you know, a limited amount of land that we can build these launch sites on. But if it ever came too crowded, we already know how to launch rockets from the ocean, which opens up a whole new world for us. So there's lots of space where we can do all this launch. launch. There you go. I don't know about SpaceX. I know they can land a rocket on a boat. I would imagine that they could shoot the rocket off from the boat too. I don't know for sure. <laughs> I even but it seems in, like that would know, be a thing. I even think in this Falcon video we watched, if you kind of look out to the left and the right, there's that blue. I almost think that might be the ocean. I could be wrong there. I so believe it is. It, but... That's yeah, great. I know most, I've seen a lot of videos of them landing their rockets back on like a big aircraft carrier. It's a big one, but you know, they're landing a rocket on it. You don't want too small of a target at that point. Absolutely. So, got like two minutes left if anyone has any last minute burning questions. That's so neat. It never gets old. Well, it doesn't look like we have much coming in. Well, if no one has any last minute questions, if you do think of something afterwards that you want to come back and ask us, go ahead and drop us a comment on the video or you can send us an email. Um, we're accessible that way and we'd be happy to get back to you if we can. Otherwise, be sure to come back next week. Like I said, we're going to be talking more about Perseverance's journey to Mars, but all the cool stuff 
stuff that happens once it leaves the Earth and before it gets to Mars. While it's in space, it actually does a lot of really fun things. And I'm super excited about that one. So same time, same channel. Be right back here next Wednesday at 1. Otherwise, you guys have a wonderful rest of your week. And we'll see you again soon. Yep. See you next time.